Okay, you have five minutes on rebuttal. Let me um, start with the appellate court ruling because it's very interesting. I'm not a lawyer and I'm not practicing law, but I believe that the appellate court's first sentence was that Mr. Armstrong as an individual is not responsible for the marijuana business tax because it would self-incriminate him in violating a higher federal law. Then it went into Medimart's the incorporation is, and as counsel said just a minute ago, um, Medimart's the nonprofit mutual beneficial corporation that is suggested in the attorney general guidelines written by our now Governor Brown, put in the word you may need to form a nonprofit mutual beneficial corporation in order to help run the day-to-day -day business of the collective or cooperative. It's my belief that the only reason, according to current California law today, that a collective or a cooperative can be in the medical marijuana business is for two very important reasons. One is that every member is an equal owner. Everybody has equal membership, equal ownership, so that when the U.S. currency and the medical marijuana exchange hands, there is no sale because there's no transfer of ownership. It's no different than a bunch of people getting together and deciding to grow oranges and produce orange juice and then share the orange juice at the end of the, the harvest. There has been case law since the letter uh, that the SBOE wrote about where it believes every individual would need to be part of the cultivation itself and it's not only in the Benini case, but also in the Jackson case, where the judge said that the members don't have to do anything but offer an equitable contribution in exchange for the medicine that they all agreed to, to grow and provide to one another. Um, secondly, you know, we can talk about the hierarchy of law, where it's federal, state, county, city, uh, at least to my best understanding, as I said earlier, I'm not a, a lawyer and I'm not practicing law, but I believe that the reason current California law only allows collectives or cooperatives is so that there is no transfer of ownership, hence no sale, because the sale, even as the appellate court said, an individual like myself or the other 20,000 other individuals don't want to self-incriminate or implicate ourselves in violating a higher federal law and admitting that a sale occurred. That's why we don't call them sales, we call them equitable contributions. And specific, specifically, California law right now says that you cannot profit from the controlled substance cannabis. Yes, it doesn't specifically say you can sell it or can't sell it, but I think that was a gray area that was put into place so that individuals like myself that came here to get into this industry and look to the government and the SBOE, how do I run this business lawfully and legally? And you read the Attorney General's guidelines and yes, it says you may need to form a nonprofit mutual beneficial corporation to help run the day-to-day -day business. I had no idea at the time that that was an illegal entity. It's not a collective or a cooperative. And as a collective, which isn't defined by California law, so it's a non-statutorial entity, it was impossible to get a certificate from the, the, S, the SOS, the Secretary of State, looking at the collective as an actual lawful business. So the only way to get a bank account, to pay employees, to pay bills, was to use the non-profit mutual beneficial corporation to get a bank account in order to do normal day-to-day -day business. And I was under the impression that I was doing everything by the book, by the law, when I got my hands on these two letters written by two legal people at the SBOE that had been questioned about a sale occurring in these transactions with U.S. currency and the controlled substance cannabis and how a collective or cooperative is supposed to be formed and organized so that you're not blatantly violating 
federal law, number one, and number two, because SB 420 didn't specifically state that you can or cannot sell marijuana, what's going on here? Well, it, I, I was in shock, to be honest with you, when I found out that, hey, wait a minute, I've got basically been misled, misled and misguided into forming an entity that is an illegal entity just so that they can charge sales taxes and say that it is legal because you're an illegal entity. When as a business person like thousands of others, you would figure that the state would say, well, wait a minute, according to the law, you can only be a collective or a cooperative. Nothing else, nothing more. And the reason why is so that you are not making sales when that exchange of, of currency and cannabis it happens. So at, the, at that point is when I picked up the phone and called the SBOE office and said, hey, I need a review. Because the way I'm looking and reading this, I'm not a lawyer, but it looks like we're doing illegal things and we're an illegal entity. And I don't want to go to federal prison for 10 years to life. And I definitely don't want to be the one guy, the managing member of 20,000 other people, individuals, that's making this decision that implicates every one of them, that they violated a federal law, a higher federal law. So, as I said earlier, I simply asked for a review, and it turned into an audit, and I said, okay, fine, here's all of our information. As the counselor over there just said, at the bottom of our receipts, it says there's no transfer of ownership. This is an equitable contribution towards the overall cost to produce the product and, and distribute it to the members because we cannot admit to a sale. I mean, I, I can go into the Controlled Substance Act, which is a higher federal law that says you cannot sell and or profit. It expressly prohibits that. And like I said, it's a 10-year to, 10 to life sentence. I could explain the Supremacy Clause which, you know, I believe in the Tenth Amendment that states have the right to make their own laws, but if the law directly conflicts with higher federal law, then there's a problem. And that's why the Supremacy Clause is put into the Constitution that says if there's a direct conflict between higher federal law and state law, then federal law preempts the state law and the states have to follow higher federal law. So as much as I'd like to contribute and, and, and and, and continue on in this industry is pretty much down to where I, can, I cannot do it. I cannot appease California on one hand and admit to selling a controlled substance. And now with the new laws coming up, also profit from it that directly blatantly violate higher federal law. I'm sorry. Uh, Thank you very much. Key members. Anyone have any questions? No questions. Did you have something, Member Well, I mean, I, I think to um, to the taxpayers' <laughs> argument, um, this is the first time I actually seen the Attorney General's guidelines or the memo he issued, which is very interesting. Um, but you know. It is a conundrum, I think, that uh, it is a Schedule One drug um, at the federal level, um, but then we have uh, passed Prop 215 and Prop 64 here that uh, as of January 1st, it will be legal uh, in the state. <clears throat> and you know, according to the uh, Attorney General memo, uh, business licenses, business licenses, sales tax, and seller's permit on page nine uh, of his memo uh, basically says the state board of equalization has determined that medical marijuana transactions are subject to sales tax regardless of whether the individual or group makes a profit and those engaging in transactions involving medical marijuana must obtain a seller's permit some cities and counties also require dispensing collectives and cooperatives to obtain business licenses so i, I kind of i understand what your argument is at the federal level right not supposed to be engaging not supposed to be selling not making a profit right not um, um, keeping books and records uh, to self-incriminate, but then we have these state laws that kind of say the opposite, 
right? You're supposed to keep books and records. You're supposed to get a seller's permit. You're supposed to, you know, report. Um, and that I think is in the conundrum um, for the board. And I don't think the board started collecting or requiring seller's permits until this memo came out, right? About 2000, 2008. 2007. Uh, huh? 2007 or 2007, yeah, I think when it, Jerry Brown, uh, August 2008. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I think it's been a very confusing to everybody. Uh, and even when I got elected to this board, um, we did a lot of education and outreach and we made sure uh, there was more information put on the, um, the websites, you know, we printed up flyers, we went and did seminars up in the Emerald Triangle, I'm just trying to let people know, well, um, you know, people still have to get a seller's permit if they're selling tangible personal property, uh, regardless of whether they're a collective or a cooperative. Um, and they, you know, I think everything is a little bit um, conflicting uh, all over, and I understand and I sympathize with you and, and others who have either come before us um, or didn't know that they were supposed to be collecting or having a sales permit collecting sales tax. And I think that's kind of how we've been ruling up here is that um, regardless, we still, you know, are following our, our state guidelines when it comes to sales tax here at this board, at least. Can I add to that? Sure. Um, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, as I said, I'm not against contributing to governmental entities that can help regulate, educate, and, and help run the industry. Uh, but just as you've honored my First Amendment right to speak freely here today and my 14th Amendment right to due process to to give me the opportunity to come before you. You will need to seriously look at the fact of, of not only my Fifth Amendment rights, but every medical marijuana patient and every California cannabis consumer, that you've got to give some kind of disclaimer, you've got to be honest, you've got to tell them, look, if you opt into this medical marijuana business or marketplace, here are the risks. You know, you, you are you are going to be considered blatantly violating higher federal controlled substance law. You do risk 10 years to life in prison. You do risk the Internal Revenue Service applying Rule 280E to you at any given time. Um, I went before the Secretary of State just before Prop 64 came out because I didn't like the wording of 64 because it makes it sound, and everyone believes that as of January 1st, marijuana is legal. And I said, well, only at a state level. You know, while it might be legal here in California, and it's not legal federally, and nothing, you know, it's, it's the old taxation without protection or representation issue here. You know, if, if I pay this sales tax, and I've asked the city of San Jose this, if I pay you this marijuana business tax, are you going to protect me or prevent higher federal authorities from enforcing and prosecuting me for blatantly violating higher federal law? And they said, well, well, no. I said, well, then how can we have it both ways? And I think that at least as, as government officials here at the State Board of Equalization, you owe it to the citizens of California to tell them up front and honestly, look, if you opt into doing this and you pay sales tax, here's what could happen to you so that they're aware of it. There's people think that marijuana is going to be legal 100% come January 1. I'm like, no, 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 no. You know, even the possession of marijuana at a federal level will get you one year. So as you respect other constitutional and civil rights, we need to respect everyone's in the state of California, Fifth Amendment right, and tell them up front, hey, if you do this, here are the risks, here are the dangers. You know, we've got a new administration in Washington now. No one knows what's going to happen here in the next few years. Uh, with the statute of limitations, 
they can go back and use exactly what you're asking for, sales taxes, as the evidence against anyone to put them in prison, federal prison, for 10 years to life. It's, as I call it, and as board member Miss May said, it's the cannabis conundrum. And as much as I'd like to play this, excuse my terminology, ganja game, and collect sales taxes for you, as long as federal law says what it says, and the hierarchy of law puts the Constitution and, the, and federal laws in, in front of our laws, we simply can't have it both ways. But I think at the very least, what California can do is tell these people what's going on. The, the gist of my hearing or my lawsuit with the Secretary of State that cost me $20,000 of lawyer fees was they added two words in California. The judge said, well, you know, Mr. Armstrong's got a point here. This makes it sound like marijuana is going to be legal everywhere. So I want you to add in California right there at the bottom. And so they did. But as we all know, voters don't read everything, you know. Prop 64 was 62 pages long, where Prop 215 was two. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a criminal. I, I'm, I'm not a bad guy. I am just simply someone who saw an issue, asked a question, and as I said, I've been asking for permission rather than waiting for someone to criminally charge me for something and ask for forgiveness later. But because this is a tax revenue question of a billion dollars or more, as we all are well aware of, the victim is now the villain. And I've, I've been a, a, a victim of bureaucratic bullying to the point of this is actually the first time in five and a half years that I've been able to, on an official record, talk to any lawmakers or, uh, you know, anybody with, with power in the, in the system to explain this conundrum and something needs to be done about it. I mean, I would ask this board to do the right thing and respect my Fifth Amendment rights as well as every other member of the collective that I managed and every other cannabis consumer in California and give Medimarts what it asked for five and a half years ago, which is sales tax exemption, exonerate this supposed sales tax that they say we owe. I mean, if we collected it and didn't turn it over, that'd be one thing, but I've been looking for permission that we can collect it and not be self-incriminating ourselves at the same time. So five and a half years later, here we are. But, you know, the Fifth Amendment, is, as we all know, is very clear. <coughs> and it says, Individuals are protected from being forced to incriminate themselves. Incriminating oneself is defined as exposing oneself to an accusation or a charge or a crime. Asking Californians to pay a sales tax blatantly violates the Controlled Substance Act on a higher federal level and incriminates anyone and everyone. And, and as I said earlier in my case with the city of San Jose versus Medimarts, the very first sentence that the appellate court said was Mr. Armstrong as an individual is not responsible for the marijuana business tax because it would self-incriminate him. The collective is 20,000 other individuals just like myself. So if I'm not responsible, neither are the other 20,000 other members. Now, yes, we had a nonprofit mutual beneficial corporation formed because the Attorney General's guidelines, and of course it said may, didn't say will, said you may need to do this, but because a collective is non-statutorial in California, not recognized by California, it was the only option we had to go get banking. And as we lost, as we went through three or four banks and lost our bank accounts because we're dealing with a controlled substance and federal law and banking law, the nonprofit mutual beneficial corporation has been dissolved and insolvent because it no longer served a purpose. I could no longer pay electronically. I could no longer 
pay payroll with checks. So this is a conundrum that we may not solve it or resolve it here today, but it, it needs to be resolved and solved sometime soon because I'm just one of thousands and thousands of business people trying to abide by the law, follow the law from the top down, from federal to state to county to city. I don't know how anybody thinks it could be from the bottom up. You know, if you follow city and county and state and you're still violating the higher federal law, then there's a problem. And this is a problem, as I said, we may not be able to solve here today. It, it takes Congress, in my mind, to either remove or reschedule cannabis from a Schedule One. It doesn't belong there with heroin and LSD. And it's ridiculous and ludicrous, as we would all agree, that methamphetamine and cocaine are Schedule Two, supposedly lesser addictive and have more medicinal value. So if the board has any questions for me about anything, you know, feel free and ask me. As I said, I've done nothing for the last nine years, but live and breathe this every day for the last nine years. I started from the bottom, worked my way to the top, and um, pretty much brought me here in front of you today, and I appreciate the opportunity you've given me to speak. Thank you very much. Um, I just uh, want to make a statement, not necessarily for comment, but for uh, you may wish to watch in this next budget uh, bill, the Rohrbacher Farr Amendment that has to be renewed annually with each budget was approved in 2014, that uh, prohibited Justice Department from spending funds to interfere with the implementation of state medical cannabis laws. So, you know, that, that does have to have an annual renewal, but it pretty much, um, I think, exempts, uh, Congress did exempt, um, because there are, I think, about 24 states or maybe more now that have a medical uh, marijuana uh, uh, component. So, um, thank you. Are there any more questions? Can I comment on that, Madam Chairwoman, real quick? Uh, one minute. The federal spending amendment, I call it the paper shield, uh, failed six years in a row right. and has only passed the last three and as we know it's still sitting on the burner. The, the key thing here is, and I, I, once again I'm not a lawyer, but the key thing here is that it provides protection for medical use, possession, distribution, and cultivation, not recreational. It's my belief that medical marijuana, as I said earlier, was never intended to allow sales and or profit. So while I understand the state of California is now turning Prop 215 upside down to where sales are mandated and profit is allowed, it, the, the federal spending amendment will not protect anyone in California that's doing recreational and as I said, it's use, possession, distribution, and cultivation. Nowhere in there does it say that it protects someone from selling the controlled substance or profiting from it. I understand. I understand. I'm just pointing it out. Not for discussion, not just pointing it out that it seems to have been working relatively well. I don't think necessarily that Congress, there's enough members of Congress to uh, do the complete uh, legalization. I think that that's not a key issue for many members, although it is in California. Uh, but I do think that it, you have to be able to count the numbers to get something passed. And so I think getting this amendment passed by a Republican and a Democrat at least offers perhaps some, some uh, protection. So are there any other comments, members? No, if there's no comments, do we have a motion? Madam Chair. I'll move to adopt staff recommendation. Is there a second? I'll second. Is there any objection? Hearing no objection, such will be the order. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you.